this is, this is, this is. So here I am, doing everything I can, holding on to what I am, pretending I'm a superman. I'm trying to keep the ground on my feet. All right, you guys, a bucket list thing happened this past weekend. I know I said that this past week, the weekend before past weekend. So um, last podcast, I was like, well, I'm doing this, but I assume the shows went great because I went and, went and played a couple Goldfinger shows, Berkeley and Anaheim, California. So uh, they did go, both went great. Um, Anaheim sold out. Thank you, everybody that bought tickets. Appreciate you guys. Um, and Berkeley was great, too. We had a blast. It was awesome. So thank, thank you both, both places. Um, but in Anaheim, John Feldy, Feldman, he, uh, he asked his buddy Tony Hawk to come sing on Superman. So I got to meet uh, a longtime hero of mine. I, I met Tony Hawk briefly, briefly on Warp Tour in France, but I, not really. There was tons of people around. It wasn't like, like it was the other night. He came back into our dressing room backstage, got to like shake his hand, talk to him. We did some pictures. We rehearsed the song backstage and he came out and, and, uh, we had a blast. It, it, it's a surreal moment for those that don't know, Tony Hawk, what rock have you been living under? You know, <laughs> everyone knows Tony Hawk, even if you don't know anything about skateboarding, you know, Tony Hawk is the, the most famous skateboarder of all time. He still is. And I think he probably will always be. He's amazing. So uh, he came out and, um, you know, his his video games, Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 and 2, and then the, the new one. And the new one's so, so cool to be part of. Uh, MXPX has let, Let's Ride on there. And it, it one of the coolest things is MXPX has been on tons of video games. But to be on a, a video game that came out a couple years ago that my kids like, and they my kids will I'll put it up here in the studio. We have a PS4 here. And I'll put it on for them and don't tell them, but I actually like blank out all the other songs on the, on the radio. So it only plays let's ride over and over and over so that my kids just to make sure that they know daddy's band is on a very cool video game. So <laughs> yeah, you can do that. Try it. But, um, I love all the songs. I mean, there's so, so many great songs on that soundtrack. It's amazing. So Superman being absolutely one of the best. Uh, it's great to be part of part of uh, skateboarding history, part of video game history, part of punk rock history, all of that, you know, um, because it was a huge moment. It really was. Like, people were like, what? Their minds exploded when, when Tony Hawk came out to sing that song. It's like, we're living in the Matrix, aren't we? Like, this, this can't be real. Like, it's just so weird. Like the, that's, you know, the six degrees of separation thing, uh, like, you know, you know, with Kevin Bacon or whatever, you know, like that's a real thing. Like you really, we are connected pretty closely. Um, you always know somebody that knows somebody that knows Tony Hawk, you know, and, and, and in, in this case, it's funny because I have a lot of friends that know Tony Hawk, so many, but I just never really, really, really had a chance to meet him. So, there it is. Bucket list for me. Um, <laughs> maybe we'll hang again. Uh, I have a feeling it's, it's not going to be the last time, to be honest. So um, it was cool. So, yeah, the shows went great. It was uh, we played Berkeley on Friday night, Friday the 13th, UC Berkeley Theater. What a crazy place. It reminded me a lot of a, a big version of the Charleston Theater here in Bremerton, Washington. And it's a, it's a local venue that, uh, you know, brings a lot of punk and metal through there and the reason why I thought of that was because in the same way there's like a bar in the back and then and then you go down into the all ages area in front and it's a giant wall that kind of separates everybody like you're like way above if you're in the bar and you're way below if you're in the all ages area at the Charleston the Chuck um but here at the UC Berkeley Theater, it was kind of like that, but it wasn't, it was all like, you, you didn't, it wasn't separated necessarily. Actually, the, the top level was, you had to have an ID to go into that bar. So it kind of was separated, but just not in the same way. You could, everybody could flow through if they needed to for the most part. But um, it was just a big version of that, you know, like this big dance floor on the bottom and then this big wall 
and then the bar. So um, almost like a halfway balcony, like the balcony started halfway down instead of like way up. Um, I don't know. I, anyway, just random thoughts. Something I was thinking about when I was like looking at the room. Um, but we had a great time. Uh, Charlie had some issues with his amp. His amp wasn't working. Of course, like everything works great at sound check. Boom, boom, boom. You get on stage. Something doesn't work. It's just that's what happens. And um, we, you know, we had, eh, you know, it, you know, we don't do a lot of shows. So like the crew, uh, we had a couple of new crew people. They were all great. But, uh, you know, we don't know what's going on with this gear. This gear is just rental stuff. And and um, luckily my stuff usually works pretty well. Um, in Anaheim, I jumped up really high at one point and came down hard. And my wireless pedal came out. Not came out. It, it The sound cut off. And I was just like, what is going on? I knew it was, you know, from, because it happened right after I jumped. It was like, jink, jink, jink nothing and so i like jiggled it it came back on all right go 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 just don't jump so hard next time just chill so i didn't chill but i, I you quickly forget like okay i won't jump anymore and then you forget and then hey, you jump ah so yeah I, I gotta i don't know it's it was a fun show i had a great time it's always fun people whenever we play mabel bring all the uh we bring people up lately it's been under 21 you have to be under 21 to to come up or maybe even under 18 i'm not sure um this is john feldman's criteria not mine i'm not asking for the under 18s uh but I, mainly it's you know to get the kids up and have fun and and it, and it really is great because the kids can do something that that uh you know it's a long night maybe they're getting tired even though they might love to be there kids get tired and and gives them a little something extra to like pep them up and uh that's fun so when we do that um so that show yeah anaheim house of blues been there so many times i i checked out of the hotel i stay uh we usually stay usually well it depends on what the what the travel plans are but this this particular time i stayed in a hotel i've been to a lot of times i like it a lot um but uh this time they charged me much more like $51 more than they should have I'm just like what why is that like and I called and the lady was like hmm that sounds well that sounds like maybe they charge you for incidentals and I'm like yeah but what you know like I think I got charged for so so let me back up I took a screenshot and I have my actual um hotel bill the the receipt that they give you that you pay and they give you the thing that says, duh, 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 you pay this much. $194, $192.94. They charged me on my credit card comes down $244.75, whatever it was. And that just seemed weird. And when I called the lady, she's like, she was nice, but she was like, yeah, that's, that's in, incidentals. I'm sure that that charge will come off. Just wait a little bit, wait a little bit. Um, and sure enough, right after I called, within the hour, my credit card bill got the 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 two forty four got rescinded. It was in red and canceled, and then a new charge was put up for exactly one ninety two ninety four. So what that tells me is somebody messed up or. Probably somebody messed up and just did it wrong, but it just seems weird, right? Like incidentals should be an even number or, um, you know, $50, $30, $50, whatever, right? Like 51 and change. That was weird. That was weird to me. So um, I've got another, what I think is a more obvious incidental charge on my room in Berkeley. $75 and it's sitting there still on there and I checked out on Saturday and and so okay maybe they can say well you know it takes a, a business day and now as as uh you know as I'm recording this I'm actually recording this on Monday Martin Luther King Day happy Martin Luther King Day to you guys um 
but I got a busy week ahead, so I just thought I would I would knock out this episode for you guys and and talk about my weekend and and what happened. So yeah, it was a great weekend, and honestly. I don't mean to be complaining about this hotel thing. It was more of like a life lesson to me because I don't usually check my bill, um, but I needed to check it to look at the, my credit statement to get some some expenses going because I had to expense a few things out and send them to the tour manager and things like that. So when I was in, in there looking at the two, I just noticed that's that's something's not right. So it's more of like a little life lesson for me a reminder lesson. It's not like I haven't dealt with something like this before, but you kind of like forget as things go well, you know, and then you're like, oh yeah, I got to check that. Okay. Yeah. And I, I texted Moon uh, over in St. Louis and, and he, he's like, oh yeah, I never thought to check my bill. Cause he, we checked in together. We went after we left the show in Anaheim, we went to the hotel together. Um, Cause we, I think we were the only two staying at that hotel. Cause we were flying out. He was flying out early. I was flying out midday. And uh, we wanted to be right at the airport. I mean, that that to me, if if I have an early flight or I just took a anytime anytime in the AM flight, I usually like to be closer to the hotel if possible. And um, sorry, I like the the hotel to be closer to the airport if possible. And um, you know, I remember uh, last time I was I don't know if it was the last time. One of the times I was in London. One of the couple times I was in London the last few years. Um, one of those times I was in a hotel downtown London and cool location, you know, lots to do, whatever. But I had that flight, you know, the next day and it wasn't, it wasn't until, it wasn't until the afternoon. It was like a three o'clock, four o'clock flight. So that to me, I was like, I can, I can handle that, you know, because I had to take all my gear, you know, walking with my base, walking with my suitcase and my backpack and I had to go on the tube, hotel, tube, to, you know, to another tram, little junction thing, and then to the airport. And it takes a while. It took, you know, like hour and a half or something, like two hours, and you're finally there. But, um, you know, that kind of thing. Like, I, I, I don't like doing that super early in the morning because what if there's, like, some huge traffic thing? And, you know, so I try to, like, plan my my logistics logistics is i mean touring in a band is all about logistics it's all about planning it's all about um and, and it, it depends on what vehicle you're in and what type of tour of course but um I, I can't believe that i can actually show up and make shows because i'm so like it's like the one thing i really take seriously is like band stuff like take like showing up for a show on time you know showing up for a flight to get to a show. I, I really take that seriously and meticulously. And I, um, I don't like to, to fail in that regard. I mean, cause that seems like even though it's part of your job, it's not really your job. You're not being paid to get on a plane or, and get on the flight on time. And, and you're not being paid to show up to lobby time, but, or lobby call. But that's the thing is like, you kind of are is as a, as a, especially as a, a musician that's that's supposed to be at a venue in a city on a certain day at a certain time and that day might be six months from now it might be a year from now it might be three months whatever it is if I had to do any other things based on those parameters I don't know if I'd be able to do it but I I guess just it's something that I've always done. Like I have a show. Okay. I got to be there. And and you don't really, I do think uh, I was going to say, you don't really think about the, the ins and outs of how to get there and how to get home and what you're going to need while you're there. And all of that, you don't really think about that until it's go time until it's like, okay, now we got to start thinking about it. But when you take the gig, a lot of times you're just like, yeah, that sounds great. Let's do it. Um, uh, but I was going to correct and say, actually, nowadays, last few years for sure, uh, last decade, a little bit gradually more and more, we actually do think about the logistics, the ins and outs, what it's going to take to do something. We can't just do a free show in Seattle and play a couple songs or whatever. Oh, it's, it's just a couple songs, so just do it for free. It's great promo, this or that. It's your, you don't have to take any flights. Well, no, we actually do because we have, 
our crew lives out of town. So anytime we do a show live, we have to have our crew there. We have to have people to help us make this stuff happen. And sure, I mean, it, we should be able to do it all ourselves, but it's just not that easy because there's so much to do. You can't physically do it all. Um, so the logistics and the ins and outs, like crew people. Okay, where is the crew coming from? L.A., um, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, wherever, right? Um, you got to think, okay, that's going to cost 1000 there, 1000 there hotels boom 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 pretty soon you're like ten thousand dollars just to like get your people to a show and um that doesn't count paying them i mean that might count paying them too ten thousand um and 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 then there's much more than that but i don't even know why i'm talking about that part of it but um yeah i'm it's wild things things um Things haven't changed that much, but I think enough of the things behind the scenes have changed that it's starting to make make everything just more work, more work, more work, as far as touring goes. And um, honestly, I mean, it's always been hard. So I don't feel like, I don't feel like it's anything to like worry about. It's just more like we have to adapt. We have to like figure out what it is we really want. And, um, we're always going to do shows, you know, we're, we, sometimes we just need to pause and figure out how to do them the right way. That kind of thing. Like, do we need more crew people? Do we need less crew people? Do we need different gear? Do we, uh, you know, like my, I'm always like with my, my wireless unit, which I started at the top of this conversation talking about how I slammed it down and, and it went out for a second, a couple seconds and I got it working again. And then I was nervous a little bit and and that's the thing is now that's in my head like I can't trust these things as far as I can throw them <laughs> and, and there's always there's some other issues with this particular Sennheiser um, wireless unit that I have and one of those things is the fact that you, you can have two packs on and they, they cancel each other out and the sh I know there's been many different packs that I've had that haven't done that um, Samson, they don't make them anymore, but they used to make a great wireless system. We were sponsored by them back in the day, and they were the best because you could have two wirelesses on at the same time. I had two bases. I would have my tech Neil have a base on and go do 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 do, and then I would go do 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 do, and then and I'd go as far as to like if you want to because I'd like to match up my my two bases, and you could do that a few different ways. You can change the pickup uh, levels. And that'll, if you raise your pickup, it's going to get louder, but it's going to get a little clackier too because it's closer to the strings. And if you, you lower your pickup, of course, it'll get quieter. It'll be a little, little duller sounding in general. Uh, it's a subtle thing, but it really does make a pretty big difference in volume. And I like to have my volumes the same. And, and another way to do that is Samson had an actual gain, um, a little gain uh, knob like a tiny little knob on the side of, of the pack. Do, do, do. So nice. Um, can't get those, you know, those are long, long out of, out of uh, stock. You know, they don't make those anymore at all. So anyway, but the new ones I have, I haven't found something that I'm like, that, that's bulletproof. I, I really like these sure wirelesses that I used um, that we all used um, the last few years. And, um, they started to stop making it. They stopped making them all together. They don't sell them anymore. You can get them used. They're just overpriced. And so it's just like, all right, well, next, you know, just try to, trying to find gear that works for you. And, 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 um, you know, it, it usually takes me a few shows to like really decide if I like something. Cause I mean, you can plug something in and it works in practice and that's fine. But really it's the heat of the show that really, really makes a difference in whether you can count on some gear or not. And um, I don't know. Th these days, my Ernie Balls, my bases, they're they're solid. You know, any Ernie Ball Stingray you get is going to be solid, but especially these signature artist series that I have. Um, and they're guaranteed. Their work is guaranteed too. So don't worry about that. Anyway, um, 
let's get to some voicemails. What do you guys think? Voicemails? Everybody's everybody's texting me right now. I'm literally texting saying, "Hey, I'm podcasting." All right. Sorry you guys. What's up? <laughs> uh Let's get to these voicemails. Hey, Mike, this is Bill from Brockway, Pennsylvania. Long, long time listener, first time caller. I've been in the MXPX since, oh, mid 90s or so. My babysitter listened to you guys and less than Jake, and that's what turned me on to punk. And I, I was into you guys before I even discovered Blink 182 or Green Day or any of that stuff. But anyhow, I have a quick gear related question for you, something you may or may not be able to answer. Watching the Christmas live stream and previous live streams, I've always really gravitated towards Chris's, like, olive drab colored Les Paul. It mm. looks like a special, but it's got the humbuckers in it. I was wondering if that was something that he had custom made for him or if it was just a model I'm not familiar with. But I'm I'm really digging it, and I was just wondering if you'd be able to have a little insight in that for me or possibly get Chris on the pod at some point and do a gear rundown with him like you have with Yuri and Tom in the past. Um, thank you for all you do. Thank you for all the freaking awesome music you keep putting out. It literally gets better with time. Every every album's a build and improvement on the last. It's It's been amazing. And being a fan of yours and the music and merch that you guys put out is just, it's an awesome time to be alive. And I'm glad to be in this, this time stance of life. Thank you again. Take her easy. Hope you guys have a good one. Bye. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate that, man. It's cool to hear like somebody that's like, want like this time stands of whatever you said about life. Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> Sorry. Time stance of life, time stands of life. Um, like time stamp of life, maybe. Um, Chris's guitar, man. Olive Drab, you nailed it. It is an Olive Drab, Les pa Gibson Les Paul. It's a 2019, and it is a custom shop. Um, a 57 LP special custom shop. I don't know if those pickups... I think those pickups came on the guitar when he got it. He got that... He wanted that guitar... If I, if I don't remember correct, if, he told us all about it when, when he got it. His wife got it for him for Christmas a couple years ago, but it was a guitar that he had picked out. It wasn't like a random guitar. It was like, I want that guitar. And then she's like, no, nah, it's too expensive. And then she's like, I'm getting that guitar. So uh, he got that guitar, and he loves that guitar. And it is all of drab, and it's very cool. Um, yeah, 2019 Gibson. Custom shop. 57 LP special and I'll have to, you know, I will try to have him back on the podcast. I have Tom and him on together, something like that. All right. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate your call. All right. Let's, uh, let's move on. You know, you're going to love the new record, Bill. If, if you're liking the new stuff, you're liking what we've been doing, you're going to love the new record. All right, let's go to the next one. Hey, Mike, it's uh, Tom Bowman here from uh, upstate New York from Bull Airs calling you again. I had another question. Um, I had a lot of friends over the years that played uh, in bands, um, that were local bands that always would play with you guys um, opening up and, you know, various times throughout the, uh, throughout the years. And maybe this is a weird question, or maybe it, is, maybe it isn't, but um, I always heard like a rumor, like especially back in the old days, like tooth and nail days when you were like, quote unquote, a heavily classified Christian band, that um, some of these bands that would go on tour with you or even bigger bands that had gone through, they had to sign a non-disclosure agreement so they wouldn't talk about that, God forbid, if you drink, drink a beer or smoke a cigarette behind, behind stage. So I was just wondering if there's any truth to that, because, like, I mean, obviously it's 20 years later, so who cares, right? But I, I understand that, you, you know, you had to keep up um, that kind of image because that's kind of what you were marketed at, at back in the early days anyways. Um, and even funny enough, li listening to your newest record and 
um, there was like a, a swear word. I think it might have been shit or something like that dropped. Um, and I was like, oh, my God, they swore. And, it, it, you know, I'm 42 years old. And just even hearing you swear was still kind of like uh, just threw me for a loop for a minute. But I was like, they're all grown ups. They're older than me. They can, they can swear. So props for doing your own thing. Just whether there's any any truth to that, that, you know, people had to sign non-disclosure agreements and, you know, keep keep a lid on because, you know, God forbid the cushion smokes a cigarette. Thanks again, Mike. Uh, again, uh, the offers that make you some um, Bow Air shoes are still on the table. Even if it's just a custom pair for you and the guys in the band, hit me up. I did shoot your DM, um, but I haven't heard anything, but I'm sure you get tons of DMs. So hit me up, and I will get you something. Thanks again. I love you guys. Love the band. Can't wait to hear the new album. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Tom, man. Thanks thanks for calling back. Um, I'll get to the, the non-disclosure question. But, yes, I do – Want and I, I want one of your shoes. I would love to get a pair. Um, I'll, I'll find you. I'll find you in there. Sorry, it just like Instagram sends me these things all the time. Like, all right, you know, if you're getting too many messages, click this button and make it all go away. And I'm like scared to do that too because I'm like, what if some, what if something really important is trying to get, you know, every now and again I'll check my DMs, but inevitably I miss some things and all that. So I will, I will try to check that out. It, it's better to DM me at, um, and you might've done this and maybe this is the problem. Cause I haven't checked the podcast DMS lately, but I will, I will, I'll get back to you, but non-disclosure agreement. Oh man, there's been, there's so many fun rumors. This one, unfortunately not true. Womp, womp, womp. No, we, we didn't even have a lawyer. We signed to tooth and nail with no lawyer. No one looked over our contract. Um, I think my parents looked over it and they're like, I don't know. Do you want to get signed or what? <laughs> you know, like, we're like, yeah, we want to get signed. You know, we don't care. You know, and then it turns out we probably should have cared um, because we signed away all our publishing rights, uh, you know, all the songwriting royalty rights, that kind of stuff. But um, we got it back. Hey, we're good. Can't keep a good band down. Um, no, that is, so no non-disclosure agreements, no, let's talk, let's have a meeting before the tour. And like, just, just so you guys know, please no pictures, no rumors, no talking about what the band's intaking, you know, they like their hookers and blow. Um, we were pretty innocent to be honest. Like we, we did drink, we did, I smoked cigarettes before we even went on tour. Like I, I started smoking to get breaks when I worked at Spiro's Pizza, Spiro's Pasta and Pizza in Silverdale, Washington. And uh, my buddy JJ, who was our roadie for a long time, roadie JJ, um, bald guy now, but you know, he was a, he was a redheaded stepchild. He, he lived at my house for a while and, you know, crashed, you know, same with Gary, our merch guy, like, but he smoked cigarettes like he started when he was like 12 years old or something like that. And, and he was always smoking and I was hanging out with him. So peer pressure got to me and I was like, but I'm working at Spiro's and everybody that smokes gets breaks. And he's like, yeah, you should, here you go. And so I started smoking cigarettes and I smoked throughout my like, I don't know, 18 to 24 or something, you know, something like that. Right. Um, and to be honest, I did uh, often hide hide it because I didn't want kids to know that I smoked and I was kind of embarrassed by it. I mean, I haven't smoked cigarettes in, uh, I would say, 20 years. I quit 20 years ago or something like that. So it's been, it's been a while, so much so that it doesn't even count on your health insurance or anything like that. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't matter at all anymore. It's like as if you never smoked cigarettes, which is wild, which is cool. So anyway... Yeah, but I, I used I just remember I used to like Marty from Ninety Pound Wuss, the drummer. He smoked cigarettes, and me and him would like hide it because back on our first couple tours, we were touring a lot of churches. I mean, not always we'd play clubs too, but we toured a lot of youth group centers and churches and and like yeah, youth centers, um, skate parks. So even if it wasn't like a religious place, it was still youth oriented, and it was about like empowering kids and giving a, pl a place for kids to go and skateboard or do whatever they were doing. And, um, 
<laughs> we didn't feel like it was uh, a good look. So we, we, we would hide in the back, you know, back corner somewhere, or, you know, in the van. I'm sure it was just gross. Just smelled terrible in the van, I'm sure. Like, yeah, it, it's wild. Like, I remember taking flights, flights where you could still smoke on the flight. In Japan, our first trip to Japan, they still allowed smoking on, on flights, and that was 1995. 95, 96, 97, 96 or 7, some, somewhere in there. Um, just wild. I mean, I'm definitely glad we live in a little bit cleaner society, but to each their own. I mean, if you like to smoke, I encourage you to just do it on your own somewhere where we can't smell it, and that's all good with me. So we're, we're good. All right. <laughs> what, a weird, what a crazy question. Like, how? I wonder how that rumor gets started that, that there's a non-disclosure agreement between us and other bands and people we come in contact with. Don't tell people we drink. I mean, that's the thing is back then it was, it was all rumor anyway because there wasn't really an internet. There wasn't, I mean, sure there was like MySpace, but it wasn't the same as it is here now, you know, where if you do something uh, and you're a celebrity or something, people will know about it. And, and, um, I'm sure nowadays people have non-disclosure agreements, but that, that didn't really, that wasn't a thing back then. I think that's a thing. That's a rumor they got started in the future, you know, like nowadays, because who even knew what a non-disclosure agreement was back in the nineties? I certainly didn't. All right, Tom, thank you. Great question. Interesting question. Um, I am here. I'm here for you to set the record straight. That's right. Oh, yeah. Let's go to the next one. Let's do one more. Three minute limit. Wait, wait, what? Three minute limit. Let's see. Okay. Do you remember playing John Boy's house down in San Antonio, Texas? Uh, it tumbled down. Forgot some, something went down in Mexico. You guys came up through Texas. We put on a big Super or I believe it's Super Bowl party or something like that, but we made it happen. The rock and road, you guys came through. We jammed out right in the living room. Still got some great pictures. I think you cut out, but uh, I got the gist of it. And yeah, I remember that. That was uh, I don't remember what year it was. It was around 2011, 2012, somewhere in there, and. Tumble Down was doing a tour. We were, we were doing a full Mexico tour. We were gonna, and we we went down, played some shows on the way down in California. We had a van and trailer. We parked our our trailer at at an Ed's like industrial parking lot. Ed from Zebrahead. Um, he's a friend of mine. I you know I was like, hey, can we park our van or our trailer in your garage while we go to mexico for like a week and he's like yeah okay cool so we dropped that off we went down to mexico with nothing but our our van no trailer we had our gear in there stuffed in there we left a few big pieces behind i think but for the most part we had everything just stuffed and we head down to t we head down to tijuana no baja baja what am i thinking we head down to we head down to uh what is it? Tecate, Mexico. That's where we were. That we started off in Tecate, and that's a much easier border to get through. It's faster because there's no traffic compared to the Tijuana border. So we played a show in Tecate, um, Ruben and um and uh you know, Ruben was a guy that we we met and signed us to his label and he had a liquor store and, and a great guy. Love, love you, Ruben, if you're out there. Um, so he was hosting the show. And then we went, we went uh, with Bernie. Bernie was our, our tour manager from Los Kung Fu Monkeys. Uh, he's the singer, but he was our tour manager. So Bernie was taking us. He took us to his house in Tijuana. We played a show there that next night. And, uh, and then we headed to Mexicali. Boom, Mexicali was was uh, different. You know, it's like it's even rougher than, say, Tecate as far as like you're in Mexico. You go through all these mountainous hills. We had to stop at a checkpoint. Uh, it was a military checkpoint, but they didn't seem too 
military e. They were like it was like military police kind of vibe. There was like a big gun trained at our van while we were being questioned and showing them our papers because you have to get like a driving an interior license to drive in Mexico, and you stick the sticker on your on your windshield. So you get that in in I think in Tijuana. Um, you can drive around Mexicali or Tecate. Sorry, you can drive around Tecate and Tijuana through that, that little area. No problem. But as soon as you go into the interior of Mexico, further east to Mexicali, and then further east after that, you're going to run into these checkpoints, and you have to have the proper paperwork. Now, we got through just fine on that. You know, and as we're going through, Bernie's like, yeah, this is, see, see that cliff right there? That's where... Um, the the cartel goes to like dump cars off of so a lot of times if a family is missing a family member they'll come up and look down and see if their car is down there and uh if it is and th they're probably not in the car they're just dead somewhere you know like killed kidnapped killed anyway we're just like uh okay so many stories you know like stories about like oh yeah one time on tour i was, it was in the middle of the night and these bandits rolled a boulder out into the middle of the highway. So we had to stop. And we're just like, take, take our money. Can please don't take our passports. We need our passports, you know, and they let them keep the passports. They let, I think they let them keep their cell phones even, but they took all their money and, and stuff. And, uh, just like, okay. And we're heading as we're still in sort of like the safe area, which is like Tijuana and Mexicali and, and, and uh, Tecate, those are all like the safe areas of Mexico. But we're heading east. We're heading towards Culiacan and, and Mexico City. And, of course, um, we're not close to there yet because we're still in Mexicali. So we have our third show in Mexicali. And Mexicali is basically south of Arizona. Not, not Tucson, Arizona. I think... Yuma, California, maybe more like that. Maybe it's like Yuma or like the Eastern California, Western Arizona vibe, like somewhere in there. So there's not much happening. Um, we set up, we went to the show, set up, had some Chinese food. Like they ordered us Chinese food in Mexico and it was actually, it was pretty good. Like not going to lie, it was actually pretty good. But uh had a great sound check. Everybody was pretty tired. Um, pretty tired because we, wait, that was Mexican. Yeah. So pretty tired because, you know, we hadn't slept much. We were, we were on tour for, you know, four or five days at that point. And, uh, you know, everybody's driving and, and doing the shows. And, and here we are, Mexicali. So we all go to the hotel to catch a nap. We didn't bring our van there oh no we did bring our van we brought our van we came back we parked in the back and we went in the show was going on and then our drummer harley came out back to go you know get get something for the show because we were going on in about an hour from that from at that point and he's just like he he gets in the van gets his thing and then he hit slams he like closes the door and notices shh, glass the other side of the door somebody had broken the glass and broken in uh the driver's side and and he's like oh no and he like runs back in gets us we all go out there we're like no my backpack was gone harley's bag was gone uh my backpack had had uh, my laptop in it. It had my song books. It had the tour money. I mean, at the very least, it was like, uh, I would say like six or $700 cash in there, uh, probably more. Um, it had all my personal little gadgets, you know, because it was my backpack. So it had, it had everything I needed. It had my passport. And Harley's, Harley got stolen his duffel bag that had clothing and his passport. Not a, Maybe some toiletries. Not a lot of like, expensive stuff but we were screwed everybody else was good um they didn't get any guitars because all our gear was inside for the show but they got us and we were just i was running all over the place looking for somebody but there's nobody to find what are you gonna do do you have my you know so i never found any 
You need the bag or nothing. It's gone. Um, and we went back in that night and just so pissed, so pissed. Just like played the, one of the best shows tumble downs ever played. We were just playing mad and, and just gave, gave it so much energy and, and we didn't take it out on the crowd. Like it was their fault, you know, but it was, uh, it was a learning experience. I, you know, after the show, um, Bernie took Harley and I to the police station. We made a police report, had to wait. You know, we got back at like four in the morning and, uh, the next day went to downtown Tecate and got our window fixed for like 40 bucks or something like that. It was very inexpensive. Got some tacos for five cents, five cents each. And we went to the border to try to find a U.S. consulate or a U.S. border patrol. And we went right into America without a passport. There was no, it was just like a turnstile, like just go on through. Okay. Um, now I'm in the U S uh, can I go back to Mexico, go back to Mexico? Like there's people there, but like the, they're just like, I told them like, I don't have my passport because it got stolen. Who do I talk to? And they're like, Oh, you got to go talk to the people here. And so I went in and went back into Mexico, back into Mexicali. And we went to this office and they're like, nobody's here today. Um, it's a, it was a weekend. It was like Sunday or something like that. So we're like screwed. Um, but that's when we started making calls and got a consulate in Tijuana to hook us up with a temporary passport. So all we had to do was go there, wait in line, do all that thing. And, and we got it. So the next, so, so that night we also, our, our breaks were about to go out. So that night we were staying at Bernie's, uh, at the time kind of girlfriend or friend. I don't know if they were really boyfriend, girlfriend, they were just more like friends, but we stayed at her house in her loft area above her garage. And I had to go around and find a, find a wrench, like, a, um, a wrench to, to change out the, the brake discs. It was like one of those C clamps. That's, that's what we need a C clamp to hold the hydraulic brake in place while you change out the drum and put it back in. So, um, I went to all these like shops and finally found one as they were closing, got the last kind of last minute, got it, got a case of beer, brought it back. We were out on the street at this lady, this girl's house in Tecate, just, uh, the Harley, uh, Harley and, and Marshall, the Trotland brothers were actually doing the, the, the work. I was like filming and taking pictures and stuff. And we got it done and, and we ate well. Uh, they cooked up some, some tacos. It was amazing. Um, and we slept great that night, you know, worried about the future, but we went back to Tijuana the next day and waited in line. And, and I remember just like, they don't let you have your cell phone or anything in there. So you have to leave it. We just, I just left it in the van and, um, we just went and just waited and I'm sitting there with a piece of paper going, trying to remember lyrics from the songbook that I lost, you know, and one of those, one of those lyrics, um, was definitely a tumble down song, you know, like, but a lot of that stuff, you know, got lost probably forever. Some of those songs will never be songs because, that was sort of at the cusp of when I started changing the way I wrote and, and, and the way I was writing songs and the way I memorized songs, the way I like uh, document the songs. So I used to write everything down. Now I write it in my phone and, and I will write it down at the end. Like when I'm done, okay, this song's done. Eventually I'll write it out because I really like to write and have it somewhere physical, but um, all my ideas are in my phone now. So that that's definitely a, a difference from back then. So we got our passports long. I mean, it was, it took a while and we finally got it. We're like end of the day in Tijuana. And I didn't mention, but Bernie took us to our house, uh, the, that the night before, uh, and we went to this old taco joint, got tacos, brought those back to his house. Uh, his parents lived there too. Like he had his like a, a separate part where he lived, but, uh, it was a kind of a traditional Mexican vibe where you have two, two parts of the house. But, um, that was one of the best feasts we've ever had. Like we felt so good that night too. Like it's all about like getting that nourishment and, and just 
getting that time to like commune together and just hang out and forget about all the chaos that's happening around you. And that was the night before we, we had to wait in line to get our passports. So we got our passports, went back out. We went back down to San Diego. Now we're late for our next show. Our show is in Culiacan. We're supposed to be already halfway there. It's a two day drive. We're going to do it in one. So we go through the border, finally get through. It takes forever because the lines are terrible in Tijuana. We get through. We start driving east towards Tucson, Arizona. We get to Tommy Rat's house about, I don't know, midnight, maybe a little before. We get there probably like more like 1030 or so. And he's like, welcome, boys. He's got this spaghetti dinner, garlic bread, spaghetti dinner, Caesar salad huge dinner and we just feast late night feast we eat we hit the road we go to we go to uh we go to uh what is it next what's this what's the town um nogales nogales mexico um and we get there like midnight to the border and they search our whole thing. They're like, what are you doing? Da, da, da. Um, we're going to Culiacan. That's one of the capital capitals of like one of the cartels, you know? So, so uh, it's kind of a little specific, suspicious. So they search us. We get, we're fine. We don't have anything on us. We go through. I'm driving. I'm driving all the way through all these small towns, small highways, Speed bumps, boom, boom, ching, boom, you know, hitting this stuff. And finally, we're just, it's 2 a.m. And I'm on the right, I'm on the, I'm on this uh, one lane highway. One lane meaning one lane one way and one lane going the other way. And this huge semi or bus comes by and just, and the, the wind of it knocked us to the side a little bit. And, and it popped one of our wheels popped a tire on the left back side. And I'm like, great, there's no shoulder. So you're on a, a two lane highway, no shoulder. So I wake everybody, everybody's sleeping at this point. They had just kind of fallen asleep or been asleep for like an hour or something. It's it's like 2 a.m., 2.30. And I'm like, we just popped a tire. We're on the road. We got to change this tire as fast as possible. We had a spare. So Boom, everybody jumped up, started going crazy. Um, the Trotland brothers, of course, start changing the tire. Bernie's out there with a pillow, a white pillow, flagging cars to make sure they go to the other lane. But anytime a car would come, we would flag them, and then everybody would stop what they were doing and get off, just in case they came barreling through. The least that would happen, you know, the worst that would happen is they smash into our van or, you know, and we lose everything, but we're not dead. So we're doing that. Uh, I'm grabbing stuff. I'm like, trying to help push things. I'm like grabbing my camera, trying to film a little bit. Um, Finally, we get it done. We get off, we get going and we get to, and what says 24 hour tire place. It's just this shack on the side of the road with big tires. And we go, we wake this guy up in the middle of the night. It's 3 a.m. He wakes up and he's like, I don't have any tires for you. And at that point, Marshall looks at us, our bass player, and says, guys, I'm done. I don't feel good about continuing on on this. I think we should turn around, go back. And everybody else reluctantly kind of said, yeah, me too. And then I said, well, I mean, if, (laughs) okay, all right, me too then. You know, like I would never necessarily be the first to do it, but if the whole band is saying they want to turn around, uh, okay, all right. Let's turn around. So that's literally, I think, the first time I ever can't quit a tour or, you know, stopped a tour. Um, but we felt like we just couldn't make it on a spare and all. What if we get another flat? We're done. You know, like we're done. There's no AAA in the middle of Mexico. And it's in the middle of the night. And we have to be that we're not going to get there until basically we have to almost go on stage. We're going to get there like 6 p.m., and then have to load in and get get it all ready to go or something like that. And then the next day, we were going to Mexico City, which is another all-night drive, leave after the show at night, drive 10, 12 hours, 
boom, to get to Mexico City. We're like, there's no room for error. With those thoughts in mind, I was like, okay, I'm going to capitulate. No problem. Let's let's turn around. We turned around. We drove back to Tucson. I called Tommy Rat up. I said, we're coming back. Can we stay at your place? He's like, come on in. We crashed all morning. We went to dinner. We jammed some songs in Tommy's studio. It was it was really fun. I made a bunch of calls, and that some of which was to some people in Texas. And we weren't planning on going to Texas, but we went to Texas, played a couple parties, private parties, got some shows. And one of those shows was one of those private parties was Johnny Boys. Um, I don't think it was a Super Bowl party. It was just it just happened to be like the day before the Super Bowl. And um, or maybe it was the day of the Super Bowl. I don't know. Maybe it was the day. I don't think it was the day of the Super Bowl. I think it was the day after, but or the day before. But um, anyway. That was why we ended up in San Antonio at Johnny Boy's house. And we played, okay, the next day we played a show at an actual club in San Antonio. That's right. That's right. I can't remember the name of the place, but it's, we've played there a couple times uh, as Tumble Down. And um, last time MXPX played San Antonio, uh, we played Paper Tiger, but we went, not last time, but two times before we went and saw punk rock karaoke at uh, at this same club that I'm talking about that Tumble Down was at. But uh, I can't remember the name of it. It started with an R. Everybody from Texas, uh, from San Antonio is like, it's this place. Um, but that guy, Angel, used to be the promoter. Uh, maybe he still is. I, I, I haven't been there in a minute. But uh, I hope you guys are going well down there in San Antonio. Always love it. I love San Antonio. One of the best cities, period. Like, I don't know what it is. I just, the food is amazing. It's, 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 uh, you know, it's just a cool place. Like, I think the people are down to earth. The people are really got a lot of love. Um, shout out to San Antonio. If you haven't heard the uh, Mixed Peaks live album, Southbound to San Antonio, that's our latest live album. Please go check it out. If you're listening to this, why wouldn't you? You know, it, only if you just hadn't heard of it. Um, but I was packing some merch today, and and a couple of those vinyls got sold. Um, so they're still they're still moving out there. Double double gatefold vinyl, by the way. Mm. All right. Um. So what happened? Let, let me finish this story. So what happened was we. We tried to make some of our losses back. We had to cancel the rest of the tour. We were supposed to be meeting up with another Mexican band that was on our label that had uh, been touring in Mexico, and it was going to be great. And we just felt terrible that we were going to have to cancel the rest of the shows. And the Mexico City show was sold out. It was just like uh, heartbreaking, but we can't make it, you know. And we tried, and we're crazy for even trying. I feel like, but so we we kicked around some some uh, last minute parties and. You know, a lot of those people were generous. They they bought merch from us to help help us out, and um, we made it back to California and got our van trailer, sorry trailer, and uh, headed home after that. But man, it was uh, it was a rough one. And you know, at some point, like our transmission went out in Oregon. And that might have even been on on the end of that tour. Um, we had to leave our van there for like days, days and days and days, but. Uh, a dude that um, I, I'd have to look it up because it's been so many years, but a guy literally hooked us up with a new transmission. Like we bought maybe, I don't even know if he charges for anything. Like he, he might've given us $3,000 in parts and labor um, doing our transmission because he was a fan of tumble down. He was an MX peaks fan as well. And, uh, Man, I just remember, I was blown away. We were all blown away. So thank you, sir. If you're ever listening to this and you randomly like put on this this episode, I only don't remember your name because it's been so long and I haven't really thought about that tour in a while. But but uh, I, now from now and again, I do think of you, obviously, because uh, it's people like you that really have helped us get along over the years. You know, shout out to Linda Turner. She's she's done a lot for us. Linda Turner and Peachtree City. Um, and there's a lot of people that have, that have helped us out over the years. So I appreciate you guys. All right. And Johnny boy and family and, and, and friends, you guys helped us out by having us. I know it was actually like probably 
just as cool for you to have us at your house. But, um, you know, a lot of it is just players need to play. And we were a band that needed to play. And if we were playing, all of our problems just melted away. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, shout out to Bob McKnight for producing and editing the podcast. I'm going to have him on as a guest soon. So hit him up if uh, if, you ha- if you want us to talk about anything in particular. Um, yeah, you know, 2023 already been a crazy year. Um, got to meet Tony Hawk. It's awesome. The new album for MXPX is still, we're still working on it, in case you're wondering. Um, I know everybody's saying, oh, we just made our best record of the year, you know, ever. You know, Blink-182 is saying that. Super Drag is saying that. MXPX is saying that. And to be honest, I hope everybody is telling the truth because that's something we could all use is some really great music. And uh, I'm ready for it. I'm ready for it. All right. Uh, If you guys want to call, leave me a message. Do so. The number is 1-360-830-6660. Haven't had any ladies calling in lately, so please... Guys, if you have a girlfriend or a wife, maybe make her call in. <laughs> Just tell tell her what you want her to say. Uh, no, ladies, tell me what you want me to talk about. We'll talk about it. All right. Until next time, uh, much love. Peace out. Peace out.